At the center of this day, we wanted to readdress the, one of the main things about this convening. We are here at the Kennedy Center, the nation's arts center, in the capital of our country, where policy is made, where the policies that we hope for and that we work for are enacted. And this is a convening all about enacting the dreams that we have and furthering those dreams. And we've already talked about education. We've talked about technology. We're going to move here in the spirit of the Kennedy Center and of the late President Kennedy to civic life, essentially, how the arts actually intersect. And I can think of no better way to actually get under the hood than that to have our friend Michael Sandel, Professor Sandel, to lead us in a debate, essentially, about the role of the arts in civic life. And to aid Michael, we have uh, three distinguished panelists, if you will, uh, and I'd like them to join us now if they would. Uh, we have Kate Levin, please. Kate, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for New York City for 12 years, and now head of Bloomberg Philanthropies, work in the arts, doing work in America and indeed around the world. Uh, I'd like to have Darren Walker, please, the president of the Ford Foundation. <laughs> Darren has been doing what Howard Gardner would call good work in the arts, and now in the hugest sector possible, really the whole world, making a difference in terms of how we live our lives and our hopes for how we want our world to evolve. And finally, joining us is Bo Willimon, who is the creator, writer of, you yes, you know it, House of Cards, uh, in a, among many other things uh, that he has written both for the stage and the screen. Uh, and now, I'd like to introduce, joining us here at the Kennedy Center, Michael Sandel. Thanks so much, Damien. We're going to have a, uh, while you're still eating, we're going to have a debate. Uh, and the debate won't be primarily among us on the stage. It will include you. We are up here really just to uh, provoke you and to frame some questions. We've been, in a way, our problem in this whole wonderful series of programs is that we're maybe too like-minded. We all take it for granted that the arts are a good thing and that the arts are a good thing for democracy. But we can't really defend that idea or be sure we're right about it unless we test it with some hard questions. And so that's what I'd like to invite you to join us in doing over lunch. Now, suppose that you are the court-appointed administrator of a bankrupt city. And there are creditors who will not get paid. Some of them are bondholders. Others are pensioners, police, Fire, fighters, teachers, civil servants who've been promised health care and a pension for the rest of their lives. But the city is bankrupt, and it looks like they won't get paid. But then <clears throat> it's brought to your attention that among the assets of this city is a museum, a magnificent art museum, and if you added up the value of all the paintings in that museum, it would be greater. It'd be over $4 billion greater than what the city owes the pensioners. What would be the right thing to do? Would you require the museum, which is a, let's assume, a city-owned museum, to sell off its Van Goghs and its Bruegels in order to keep the promise to the police officers, firefighters, and school teachers. How many would say yes? 
you would sell off the art to keep the promise to the pensioners. Raise your hand if you would say yes. And how many would not? How many would say no? The majority say, say no. Now, there's a challenge. Well, let's hear. Let's hear from those first in the minority. Those who would sell off the Picassos to pay the, the teachers' pensions in health care. Why would you do it? Who will get our discussion started? Yes. Wait, stand up. Tell us your name. This was someone who performed one of those remarkable poems who gave us a poem earlier today. Tell us your name and then what you think. Um, my name is Tajay Williams. I'm part of the Split This Rock and the DCU Slam team. Right. Uh, I'll say I would um, sell the art because the um, teachers, police officers, and firefighters out here every day risking their lives and stuff. And it's a painting, and it's always going to be a painting no matter who you sell it to. You can go, people who are probably interested in seeing the painting will probably fly or travel to go see that painting. I think that, um, like, right now, if a teacher or firefighter is struggling, I think you should be able to pay them. Why have a job if you're not getting paid? That's the point of working. It is. Thank you for that. Really good. All right, so TJ's made a pretty powerful argument in favor of selling the paintings. Now, let's hear from someone who disagrees. The majority disagrees. Why, why do you disagree? All right, we have another of our poets. Go ahead. <laughs> I believe that art is important and that it should be preserved and saved in any way. I do also agree that teachers and firefighters, they do a lot for our communities, but I feel as though there are other sources where we can find them and come. We should preserve the arts. But wait, wait, wait. You're, it's a good answer. But you're making it a little bit too easy, aren't you? No. Because you said you'll be able to find that money someplace else. Well, maybe you can, and we'll come to that. But suppose you couldn't, and your only choice were selling the art or paying the police, firefighters, and teachers pensions. What would you do? You would still sell it? Uh, sorry, you would still not sell it? I would still not sell it. I don't know. That's, that's, this is a tough question, but well. <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> I don't know, can't we compromise here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, are we allowed a hybrid? So what I, it's on, hello? What? Okay, what I would do is. Uh, Wait, I tell us. I'm sorry, I'm Megan Smith, I'm the US Chief Technology Officer. So I think yes. there's an in-between place. What I would do is, you said there's an awesome building. So we said that the art is in? Yes. Okay, so what I would do is, I would um, sell the art on this condition. It must arrive in the building twice a year for a chunk of time for the, for the city art festival. And the other time of the year, I would flip the building into a community maker art participatory space where people can found companies, do art, collaborate together, and make a nexus modern awesome space from which the Internet of Things and maker community will invent fabulous IP, and so the license from that will be used to fund the festival, fund the city, and fund the pension, plus we will have, will have funded the pension of everybody. So we create a collective hybrid solution that then will make but the future city jobs doesn't own, for our city. But the city doesn't own the art anymore, except twice a year they can come see it. That's okay. That's okay? Yeah, because then everybody gets to go and experience it, and a lot more people will come see it because it's so exciting to visit the space. And, uh, and so they'll get to see it, and then the individual people. And we'll have to decide as a community collective vote what the amount of time that the owners Don't have to bring it if they're allowed to sell it so they right. feel comfortable. Fair enough. Yeah, thank you. So my name's Eddie Eiches, and I'm a union guy. And I, and I have to say that I would absolutely put the people first. The people who, who earn these pensions 
are still probably even living in the city, which may very well be abandoned, and a la the uh, hybrid uh, uh, choice, I would ask all of the suburbs, rich suburbs who have abandoned the city, to provide uh, financial support to keep the museum going. All right, so people are looking for other ways out, other ways to raise money, and of course that would be desirable. But uh, we've heard some arguments both ways. There was one former museum director who wrote a letter to the editor at the New York Times when this was actually being debated in the city of Detroit, who said, well, he was, he was on TJ's side. He said, this former art director said, how can we, museum director, how can we equate a few pieces of canvas with paint on them with the pensions of thousands of firefighters, nurses, police officers, teachers, and other civil servants. What do you think, Kate, of the arguments we've heard on both sides? Wh which, way, which way would you have voted? Um, I would have voted not to sell. Not to sell. I think all the arguments are compelling, but as a former bureaucrat, I would point out that once you sell, that fixes your budget for maybe a year and a half and it doesn't solve the problem long term. So if there's a fundamental structural deficit that has created the bankruptcy in this city, selling an asset for a one-time bump is in fact gonna leave you back in the hole two years later with no further resources. In the meantime, you will have depleted the city of one of the few anchors that could possibly uh, reboot its restoration as a vibrant place to live. Oh. Well, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I mean, if you, t if you push that to more extreme example, you know, there's, there's a, a mother and her kids freezing in the middle of an ice field. And uh, sitting in front of them is Mademoiselle d'Avignon and a pack of matches. And if they don't burn this painting, they're going to freeze to death. Well, I know what the mother's choice is. She's gonna burn the painting to save her kids. She's not even gonna hesitate. Um, you know, <clears throat> and what would your choice be if it means the death of someone over any piece of art? But I think it's a bogus question because, <laughs> because uh, you know, the, the, the question is if this art is in some way damaging to or detrimental to this society, this community, this city, uh, then therefore things that are detrimental we should excise. Uh, but I think it's a really hard argument to make that any collection of art or any support for the arts, which more or less is nil anyway, um, is in any way doing damage to a community. You're posing the question that your only way of of coming up with $4 billion is to sell the art. And that's just not realistic. It's just not, I mean, in terms of a city's assets, in terms of the way that a community can, you know, find money uh, elsewhere through other means, uh, whether that's reorganizing a budget or other assets it has, to say that, the, the, that all, of the, all of its money, all of its resources have been disproportionately funneled into this art museum. That's just not the case with America or anywhere else in the world. You know, it's a tiny, tiny little sliver. We, if anything, the, the arts are, uh, you know, sort of on the lifeline themselves. And the question is, what are you gonna do to save the arts as opposed to the other way around, the arts saving us, come on. All right, I want to turn now to Darren, who actually is one of the heroes of the real-life version of the story. But, but before, before coming to the solution that involved uh, created, raising uh, over $800 million from a combination of foundations, uh, the state, and donors to the Detroit Museum, which is what actually happened. First, Tell us a little bit about whether the scenario that I described respond to Bo's suggestion that this is, this is entirely bogus because there are always other sources of, of money, there are other assets that a city has. How did the problem 
how, how close to this hypothetical scenario before the grand bargain? How, was that pretty close to what Detroit actually faced? It is almost exactly the scenario that the city found itself in when literally it was without any assets to monetize. The court determined that it was insolvent to the tune of about $8 billion and that um, its, most valuable, its most valuable asset was, was the DIA. And, um, the museum. The museum. Detroit Institute of Art. And um, its real estate uh, holdings had dwindled over the years and for the most part um, had been deemed um, non-monetizable. Um, the water system was monetized, but, but that, that was all. I mean, the, the equipment and, and other city property really had been valued at a de minimis level. So to my mind, I think the thing that was often missing, I, I do believe that uh, the, the art should not have been sold. I do believe the real heroes in the grand bargain were the union workers who were the only people to actually uh, take a diminished position uh, by voting themselves less uh, of, of a retirement benefit, which was a hugely courageous um, and, and remarkable thing that the union workers did that. Um, but the thing that was often not mentioned when we talked about the contract with the, the workers, the retirees, were the, the contracts with the donors. All of the art in the Detroit Institute of the Arts is donated mostly by private collectors and donors. And rarely was there a conversation that, that said, well, what about the obligation to those donors who gave the art for the public benefit. And for, because the city of, Demo the city of Detroit um, so desperately relies on the DIA as the anchor of its cultural heritage and its legacy and its future, uh, this is what, this is the connection to democracy building uh, without having uh, a vibrant uh, civic space where people give for the public good, our democracy is diminished. So yeah, you would see, you, the, go here's, ahead, here's why it's bogus, because <laughs> no, here's, why, here's why it's bogus. That's a real situation, but if a number of financial institutions fail because they've over leveraged themselves, the federal government spends hundreds of billions of dollars to bail them out. But when there's the potential for an arts institution you know, that's on the chopping block to fail, there's no mentality of this is too big to fail. You know, well, we, the city, I mean, in this instance, the city of Detroit went to Congress right. to ask for help and basically was told, you can fail. Exactly, right. But see, if, if the feeling is that the, it's okay for the arts to fail and it's not okay for financial institutions to fail, then I think it's a matter of values. You know? And the art that we inherit is entrusted to us uh, to take care of it until we all die and someone else is taking care of it. And, uh, and if you say it can, we can fail, it's okay for that to fail, then you're saying, we are, we are protecting a society that is supposed to be about free speech, but providing no outlet for that free speech. So what's the point? You know? So when you look at, when the priorities are that art is not, is not too big to fail, uh, then, then, then you're creating the problem that you presented. But, but I challenge the value system. All right. Is there... Now, the foundations came in with the help of the state and other donors with this grand bargain. And so the art was shifted to a nonprofit trust. You'll tell me if I've got this Correct. right. And the pensioners, though they did, as Darren points out, accept some reduction in what they had coming to them, 
they were made much closer to being whole than would have been the case had there been no such bargain. So the pensioners were helped. Now, here's, here's a question, Darren, for you. So you might say, you might look at this scenario, of course everyone celebrates it, rightly, but you might look at it and say, those pensioners were lucky that the creditors, including the bondholders, were kind of holding that art museum hostage. Because that's what got foundations to put up huge amounts of money. Suppose there had been no art museum, but a city on the edge of bankruptcy, pensioners about to lose their pensions, Without the art museum there to save as a hostage, would the Ford Foundation have gone in in a big way to help bail out the pensioners? Or was it only because it was at the same time a way of protecting the art museum? No, we wouldn't. You wouldn't? No. Does that mean you value the art more than the pensioners? It means that this unique circumstance, which brought the intersection of the work we do around democracy, cities and urban planning, low income, low skilled workers and their rights came together. There are many places where pensions across the country are underfunded and it is not philanthropy's role to solve that. Certainly not to, to pay for that. Maybe doing the research, supporting policy to fix it, but it's not philanthropy's role. It is philanthropy's role to support all of the institutions of a democracy and a great city. And in this case, they came together. There are very few places where this is happening today. And would, and this uh, put to anyone on the panel who would like to address it, does uh, Darren's last answer suggest that foundations are more concerned with protecting, in this case, an art museum than dealing, than giving money to um, help pensions or provide health care for workers or uh, let's say, to alleviate homelessness, other problems not directly to do with art. Is, is it right to accord art that kind of priority, do you think, Kate? It's right for government to undertake the responsibilities for which it collects taxes. I can't believe I'm sounding like so much a Republican, but anyway. Um, you know, that's, I love Republicans too, I'm just saying. That's, the role of government is to fulfill the role of government. The role of the private sector is, wherever possible, to lead, to do experimental things that public tax levy monies should not be used for until they have a demonstrable purpose in working, but you know, here's, here's a counterexample to this, and it picks up on what Bo was saying. In 1977, I believe, there was a catastrophic flood at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, um, and the uh, question was whether the building was worth reviving. Owned by the city of New York, city ended up investing some money to fix it. In 1982, the then artistic director of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Harvey Lichtenstein, had created a theater company that almost went bankrupt that year required a second infusion of public funding to prop it up, or should they sell the building, get rid of it, you know, cut your losses, move on. Again, the city decided to reinvest in that facility. At this point, arguably, the most exciting thing to happen in any major city in the United States in terms of uh, urban redefinition is the advent of the borough of Brooklyn in the city of New York as the most exciting place for young people to live, to work, to be the hotbed of the newly defined creative sector. And arguably the single institution to lead that renaissance is the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So it's a long-term, short-term thing that you also have to think about. What is the role of government? What's the role of private philanthropy? But also art is not a short-term asset. It's a long-term play, particularly when it comes to cities. 
And you know, we often do things for instant gratification that prove tragically wrong for the benefit of society and for all kinds of people in it. And I think, Michael, you're, you are creating this dichotomy that, is, that plays right into the critique of the morning conversation, which is m museums and particular institutions like BAM or the DIA are intrinsic to the identity of a city. So to, to say, just chop off its hand, just chop off its arm and, and sell it and go on about your business, it's impossible to, um, to, to do that and to be whole as a city and, and, so, and to be whole as a democracy. If we don't have institutions that represent who we are, what we stand for. And our potential, what we can be. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how foundations became the bad guy here because they're not <laughs> saving you know, people's pensions. It's the government's responsibility. You know, the founda in, a, in an ideal world, foundations wouldn't be necessary because the government would, you know, be able, we would be able to organize ourselves in such a way that, that we didn't have to um, sort of look to the, to the private sector for that. But, but, you know, I come from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, St. Louis has a lot of problems. Uh, some of them have been flashed across the headlines uh, over the past several months. Those problems go way back. They have to do with race. They have to do with socioeconomic disparity. They have to do with urban planning. Um, you know, they, they, have to, they have to do with, uh, you know, a, a failing in industrial economy. And so, I mean, on and on and on. But we've got a free art museum there. 100% free. Anyone just walk in the doors and walk around this museum. And I used to go there almost every day after school. I was a painter before I, I got into writing. And one of the great things about the St. Louis Art Museum is people from all over the city go there. They don't have to pay a dime. You're seeing kids from North St. Louis. You're seeing kids from South St. Louis. You're seeing people from the inner city and people from the county. And they're all there. And what does that say? It says here in this museum, uh, my, you may have a lot more than I do day to day, but that painting is as much mine as it is yours. I can stand there and look at it for as long as I want to, just like you can. You know, uh, it, here we are all equal. Here we occupy the same space and we have the same ownership. And that's not only equalizing, but it's something that we can collectively take pride in. And I think it is a physicalization of hope and inspiration and what is possible. And the farther you are away from what seems possible, the more important that sort of hope and inspiration is. You know, what isn't, isn't the dream of every city, any person to be the most evolved, excellent, best versions of ourselves? And isn't the art that we produce and that we revere uh, proof of that? Of, what's, of what we're capable of together. Yeah. All right, the panel has been uh, drawing a connection between uh, art and democracy, which is really what we're here trying to test. <coughs> Before we conclude, I wanna put, I wanna shift from an art museum to the theater. We have Oscar Eustace here, so I wanna, I wanna put a challenge to the democratic civic mission of the theater. Oscar knows about that because he heads the public theater in Central Park. Yay. One of, the, one of the, the greatest philosophers of democracy argued, contrary to what maybe all of us in this room just assume, that theater is bad for democracy. This was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In the mid-18th century, there was a debate about whether to have a theater, create a theater in Geneva. They had them in Paris, but not in Geneva, which was a sober, disciplined, Republican place, small r Republican, concerned with civic virtue. And Rousseau's argument against the theater, Oscar, was that it cultivates bad habits, it enervates civic virtue for two reasons. It panders to passions, cheap passions. It doesn't trade in reason. And it's isolating, it's not truly public. 
He said, here, here's a passage from his case against the theater. People, it's a form of amusement, not of virtue, not of civic virtue. People think they come together in the theater, but it is there that they're isolated. It is there that they go to forget their friends, neighbors, and relations in order to concern themselves with fables, in order to cry for the misfortunes of the dead or to laugh at the expense of the living. And he said, it's only reason that's good for nothing on the stage. Let no one attribute to the theater the power to change sentiments or morals, which it can only follow and embellish. An author who would brave the general taste would soon find himself writing for himself alone. Moliere, who was the greatest playwright of the time, even Moliere did not shock the public's taste. He was a slave to it, maybe a creative slave to it. It is said that a good play never fails. Indeed, I believe it. it that's true, because a good play never shocks or challenges the morals or the manners of its time. Let, so he was in favor, so he, he was not against entertainment, but the civic democratic entertainment, Rousseau thought, were public festivals where there were not passive spectators in the audience and then actors on the stage. The true civic festival was the only kind of theater appropriate to a democracy where the spectators were at the same time participants. Let us not adopt these exclusive entertainments which close up a small number of people in melancholy fashion in a gloomy cavern, that's the theater, and keep them fearful and immobile in silence and in action. No, Democratic peoples, these are not your festivals. It is in the open air. Maybe he meant the public theater in Central Park. <laughs> Under the sky that you ought to gather and give yourselves to the sweet sentiment of your happiness. What do you say to that, Oscar? <laughs> I have been set up. Um, but I've been set up by masters. My, my mother, who was a Puritan scholar, said to me when I said I wanted to go into the theater, that why would you want to tell lies to strangers in the dark for money. <laughs> um, she, she had read Rousseau or anticipated him. Just great minds worked on similar lines. Um, listen, the, the two, the, the, she overcame that, by the way. She was very proud of me, my mother. <laughs> the, the two things I want to say is that, first of all, it's simply wrong to suggest that reason is the only thing necessary for democratic citizenship. If that were the case, we'd be a very different country. Passions, are abs passions that form our identity are part of humanity, and I think actually the key thing to democratic citizenship is the ability to empathize with somebody else's point of view, to actually imagine how somebody else is seeing this situation. Without that virtue, democracies can't work. If we think truth is monolithic, if we think somebody has the truth, it's either me or you, the democracy won't work. It's only a power struggle. What drama believes, and it's why drama was invented in the same decade, in the same city that democracy was invented, is that the truth comes from the disputation between different points of view. That dialectic is what produces the truth. The other point I want to say is he, he actually was also reading Lear de Besnay's Manifesto for Public Works because I don't disagree with him. I think actually one of the new program that uh, the genius Lear de Besnay has been founding at the public and we've been working for the last few years precisely is trying to break down the boundaries between spectators and performers, trying to say that it has to be a continuum that we can move on rather than absolute separation if we're going to have a true democratic theater, but that's a longer discourse. Okay, well, we've begun a longer discourse here. Thank you for that, Oscar. <laughs> what this very brief... No, he hadn't prepared that. If you're wondering, <laughs> he just, he can do it. What, what this discussion of art and civic life suggests, whether we're talking about the, museum, the Detroit Museum or about the dispute over the theater in Geneva in 1758, 
is this. We sometimes take for granted, we, those of us who come to convene in gatherings like this, the democratic case for art, the civic case for art. But I think sometimes that leads us not to take with enough seriousness the danger of art. Rousseau, in worrying about the theater, he was, he was censorious. He was worried about the effect of sitting in a theater on the habits and dispositions of citizens. And he thought it would enervate their sense of unity and commonality and identity with the whole and, and would undermine civic virtue. Now, one answer would be to say, oh, it's just a play. How could it do all those things? But that answer actually defends art by disempowering it. Oscar didn't do that, maybe because he remembered that the words of his mother were echoing in his ears. I think that to make the civic case for art requires that we acknowledge, not deny, its possible effect on character, including civic character, on the way we are, the way we act and think and move in the world. In which case, the case for art can't be, as Rousseau thought it must be, only to comfort or to amuse, but to challenge and to provoke and sometimes to inspire. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to all of you. Thank you.